Good afternoon, everyone. We're so happy that you're here watching theCUBE live on day one of our coverage of Google Cloud Next 23 from San Francisco. Moscow East South, specifically, is where we are. Lisa Martin with Dustin Kirkland. We're going to be having a great conversation next about the value of generative AI. If you happen to catch the keynote this morning, a lot of a lot of uh, famous characters on stage, lots of news on AI and Gen AI. We've got Ted Quatler here, field CTO of Data Robot. Welcome. Right. Thank you for having me. Arvin Thenagara. Dana Garajan is right. here as well. I'm sorry. Uh, you're good. You're Vice good. President of Data Science and Analytics at Gannett USA Today Network. Welcome, guys. Great Glad to have to be you. Here. Yeah, Thanks speaking of news, us. huh? Let's talk about the news. Let's talk about the news. Guys, talk about some of the things. Did you were you in the keynote this morning? Uh, no, actually, I had to be here answering questions at the booth. <laughs> I see. So but I all the news. Talk working. about <laughs> yeah. you were working. Talk a little bit about. Give us like kind of a, a glimpse into the value gen driven gen AI. What does that look like? Lots of news from Google this morning, yeah, partners. Lots of good news. Yes. Absolutely. But I think organizations really have to focus on how to go from kind of that uh, innovation and thinking about where it could fit to actually delivering value to the enterprise. I think that focus really uh, is taking shape now and will will do continue to do so over the next 12 months probably. Um, for us, I think it's about um, being flexible. Yeah. Models are coming up all the time. And right. We want to make sure that we're flexible and avoiding technical debt, only building in one direction. Everyone's talking about Gen AI all over the globe. We can't yeah. not talk about it, but there's, and this potential is huge, but there's also some barriers to success. Ted, talk about some of those barriers and how DataRobot can help customers really start dialing down or removing some of those barriers. Yeah, absolutely, and I think the, the truth of the matter is there's 140 or more open source LLMs, there's a lot of proprietary LLMs, yeah. they're all great, they, you know, uh, uh, but you need to have a, an ability to evaluate them, right? And I think the monitoring and governance aspect is where a place like DataRobot really shines. Mm. We can help measure for toxicity, cost, um, truthfulness, a bunch of different dimensions, all on one platform, no matter which LLM you choose. Arvin, tell us a little bit about your company, what you guys are doing, and then we'll get into the partnership. Yeah, at uh, Gannett USA Today, we um, own the USA Today Network, which is our you know, national um, uh, publishing outlet. Along with that, we also own uh, more than 200 local uh, publishing outlets as well across the US and uh, UK. So maybe connect us, connect the dots, all the way from the end user, customer, subscriber, uh, to a USA Today property, uh, walk that all the way back to uh, Data Robot and then ultimately Google Cloud and show us how this you know, AI technology is impacting the lives of presumably millions of people, right? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, as Ted pointed out, we have a problem of plenty, right? So Gen AI is a rapidly evolving field and there are like thousands of ways to you know, put put together an end-to-end -end application. And at Gannett, we want to be really thoughtful um, and measured about um, you know, how we leverage generative AI. You know, we, we want to um, you know, proceed in a way that's uh, responsible and safe for our end consumers. Um, so, it, you know, from an application standpoint, you know, we are prioritizing use cases um, that doesn't impede in the way, you know, we want to uh, integrate, um, you know, nuances of generative AI in the end-to-end -end workflow of an application. Um, and we always want to have the, the newsroom or the editor, you know, to have the last say, you know, this, having a human in the loop is critical, especially, you know, at this stage of evolution of generative AI. Yeah. So, you know, immediately before the consumer, we'll have, you know, our editor who is um, just looking at um, the output that was generated by a generative AI application, you know, having the ability to, um, you know, edit it, or approve it and you know give us the send the feedback loop to you know whether the application works well or not. Um, and then there are like so many steps in the process, right from um, you know getting the right LLM on board, you know, development, maintenance of the model, monitoring the model, adding the governance layer. Well, I have to think, you know, some of what we heard today from Google and the, the keynote and others, some of the new features around uh, attributions, being able to connect directly back 
uh, you know, you ask a Gen AI a question, yeah. and how do you ensure that it's not hallucinating, that it's just not yeah. making, making yeah. up something? That's got to be super important in your That's industry. Yeah, absolutely. That, right? we, we, we have the ability to provide a, con a confidence score uh, okay. with a model, and you want to know what words in your query are driving the response, what words from the vector database are uh, most relevant in the response, and then of course you would want to cite, cite like I have a citation if sure. possible, and say we, we believe that this summarization came from this chunk or from this article. I think, especially in media, you know, what is truth and in our interpretation of live events, um, we've seen that that is super impactful on so many different dimensions that it's important that we have those types of guardrails in place. It's, it's, go ahead. Sorry, it's powerful to have you know, the citations of you know, how did this output come about and um, just also enabling the ability for the human uh, in the loop to provide feedback, yeah. you know, to uh, you know, enable learning you know, of yeah. the model and fine tuning the model, it's critical. Yeah. It is critical. Arvind, talk a little bit about why you chose to work with DataRobot and Google. Uh, you, 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 know, you had me at the confidence factor because that's one of the huge yeah, absolutely. challenges. absolutely, I worry about it, right? Right, <laughs> but what was the sort of deciding factors that really told you DataRobot is the right technology with Google Cloud yeah, to do so, this? Yeah, so I mean, first of all, we are um, strategic, Google is a strategic partner of ours, you know. Uh, Google is a unified platform that has data and AI, so it's a one-stop shop for us. And um, a lot of our um, machine learning models, the predictive AI models, um, we have been building on Vertex AI. And, um, you know, DataRobot is pretty, really flexible in the sense yep. that they could fit into like any step in that end-to-end -end process and help us with automation you know, of those models and um, they also help us extend you know, the, uh, the feature set of a model where for example um, in an existing you know, model like forecasting or propensity modeling uh, we could leverage their robot just to provide the monitoring uh, you know, and the observability uh, aspects of that model. So it's pretty synergetic how we work with Google and Data Robot. Talk a little bit, Ted, about the confidence factor. I want to go back to that in a minute. Because it sounds to me like that may be a, a, an element of differentiation for Data Robot. Can you talk a little bit about that from that why data robot perspective and how that might be sure. one of those obvious no duh why? Yeah, so <laughs> um, over the last decade, data robot has really pioneered a lot of ML ops and governance, and we always thought that what we wanted to do is build a stable enterprise grade models on the predictive kind of good old fashioned AI, right? So along comes LLMs, uh, language models are a couple years old, but in particular these instruct models, these chat models, we thought it would, you know, rather than jump into a very crowded space building our own LLMs, where the technology is going to iterate and be nascent, we decided we should be really focused on how do you monitor and make enterprises feel comfortable with this type of technology. Yeah, so let me clarify that. So there's a lot of LLMs out there. For sure. Uh, more every day. Are you creating your own or? We're not. We want you to bring the yep. best of breed tool and use any vector database. What I will say is we have very tight integrations with like uh, BigQuery, uh, we, have, we can do a lot of the feature engineerings there. We can monitor vertex models. We can monitor Palm, uh, MedPalm. Yep. You know, we have demos of MedPalm and others. So we want people to use the tools that are best suited for their task, but you want uh, an ability to measure cost, toxicity, confidence of the output, right? Yep. Arvind, share some of the, the, you guys have been working together for a few months now, I believe. Yeah. Yep. What are some of the outcomes or the benefits that at USA Today has has gleaned so far from this partnership. Yeah, um, you know, with Data Robot, we've already automated multiple steps um, in the machine learning lifecycle for hundreds of our models now. Um, you know, and these are models mostly in the realm of predictive AI um, as of now. And what that allows is it creates efficiencies and saves time for my team of data scientists, um, you know, with steps like data pre-processing automated, model building automated, and you know, just governance of those models, and um, you know, measuring just the performance of those models, all automated, so we can you know uh, allow the data scientists to go do what you know they're really passionate about and build more and um, build more partnerships within our organization rather than you know, just putting the head down and, and coding um, all through. So those automations really help, and we believe that that partnership um, 
can extend to the generative AI realm as well, and we've already uh, started talking about um, you know partnering on um, uh, you know proof of value of sorts to start building generative AI applications together. Yeah, yeah. Along those lines, how much of uh, how much of it is is it the learning versus the inferencing? Are you taking advantage of both? Uh, you know, custom. Uh, customizing the content, uh, you know, how are you packaging that up for those end users and subscribers? So we are, like, like I mentioned, really thoughtful about which use cases to prioritize, right? So for now, we are prioritizing use cases that um, generate efficiencies for our teams. Yeah. So our teams can reinvest that time into uh, just adding more value for our audiences and creating you know, um, richer content experiences for our audiences. Um, so it's, it's all about, again, um, enabling uh, our teams to you know, just do what they do faster, more efficiently, yeah. be more confident about the output. So we are prioritizing those kind of outputs now. Yeah. Share a little bit about, from the audience perspective, uh, uh, we're so demanding, right? <laughs> we want relevant content, we want personalized content, we want to believe it. Yes. We want it to be updated in real time. Share a little bit, Arvin, about, from a cultural perspective at, at Gannett USA Today, been around for a long time. The cultural appetite clearly is there to go in the generative AI direction. A lot of companies are dipping their toe in the water, not really sure where to go, but there's always a challenge when it's a history to organization. Yes. Talk about the appetite at your organization to go the AI direction to help really serve yeah. the audience and give them what they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, we are one of those companies that are like tipping our toe in the water. You know, we are still in pretty much in the uh, experimentation you know, phase in that journey as well. And we are trying to strike the right balance between like moving fast but being sure, you know, about um, how we are going about it because again like you said getting our customers to trust us you know with the content that they are consuming is really critical yeah. for us so which is again why we are like prioritizing use cases that just for now helps create efficiencies within a workflow rather than um, you know use cases that directly um, you know engage with the audiences you know we are really strategic about the use cases we prioritize yeah. To talk a little bit about so about healthcare. I think you guys made some announcements recently. Yeah. What are some of the key use cases where where Data Robot is really helping healthcare organizations adopt? AI? Yeah, absolutely. So you think about healthcare is this space where you have this dialogue with your doctor, your care provider, but you're processing a lot of information. Sometimes you don't even understand all of it, right? And and it's a great use case for summarization. So you we actually announced something with uh, uh, one of our customers where we, you can uh, observe and have the audio for a patient dialogue, it gets summarized, put into the doctor's notes, so that wow. improves the doctor throughput. That means they can see more patients or spend more time with you, and you also then have the ability to have advocacy, right? Because now I can understand it, I can ask for it to be explained in a way that I can understand it. Oh, what is this drug? What are the side effects, right? You start building out these very specialized language summarizations. I think there's a, a real value to patient care there. Huge. Yeah, so in, in that scenario, and I'm asking this as a, as, a, as a former product manager, in that scenario, who do you look at as your, your customer? Is it the, the patient receiving the care, or is it indirect? Is it you know, B2B to C? Are, are you selling that to the doctors in the hospitals? And the yeah, what I'll say as someone who used to run our AI ethics group, um, is that I would actually focus on the person who's most impacted, so that's the patient. Yep. If you nail that, and, and it comes with the right efficiencies, the others will fall into place. If you go after, oh, I'm going to sell into the healthcare space without thinking about the patient, you could miss the mark and actually do patient harm. Yep. From an AI and responsible AI perspective, that's the worst case scenario. Right, right? and so tying this back to Gannett and USA Today, you certainly look at the, the, the content absorber, that subscriber, as the end customer, and you're serving If you all build that for that together. person, yeah. and they're happy, and in that case, they may not be happy, it's a, it's a medical examination, right? right. But if, they, if their needs are met in a way that's ethically sound, that you can feel confident in the summarization, um, then I think you're, it, it will uh, pay dividends, I think, for, for, the, uh, for the patient and the, the doctors, the healthcare providers. 
I think it's all about um, you know centering everything around just driving value for that end consumer. Yeah. Right, it's as simple as that. You don't want to miss the mark. Yeah. No. I would say. No. You know? No, but you bring up a great point. It was a great point that you brought up about in terms of who are you selling to. To your point, you need to understand the use case from from their from the customer's pers the patient's perspective, the subscriber's perspective. Uh, the banking consumer's perspective to really understand what problem do they have that we can help solve and how do we then work with the organization yeah. to apply technologies like Gen AI, Vertex AI For to help solve and meet the needs that the ultimate absorber of that has. Yeah, absolutely, and I think generative AI and, and these chat bots have shown the average consumer wants to interact with machine learning technology in an intuitive and contextualized way. These predictive models have been out there for years. Language models have been out there for years, but putting a chat interface and allowing that, and, and you see this hyper growth of users, it shows that that's the way to, to really interact with people. When DataRobot does a lot of its very sensitive uh, machine learning work with our customers, we often start with an impact assessment. And we don't talk about just the impact to the business, talk about often the people who are most at risk. What's their impact? How do we mitigate that risk? That's a great viewpoint. What's next for Gannett USA today from an AI kind of journey perspective, yeah. Arvind? No, so we've already implemented a couple of generative AI use cases that you know we're still testing, learning about the opportunities and the pitfalls um, you know, of uh, leveraging a powerful and rapidly evolving technology yeah. like generative AI. Yeah. And you know, we have a long list of potential use cases that you know we've um, uh, again, we've sort of scored them against uh, our ability to like pull it off. How much value does it drive for the subscriber? You know, is um, how feasible it is, um, and so on and so forth. So we already have a prioritized list of uh, use cases that you know we again we'll continue um, experimenting and we'll le keep learning by doing. And you know that's where partners like Google and and Darebot come in and, and we lean on them to yeah. execute on that vision. Sounds like a very symbiotic, strategic partnership. Last yeah. question, Ted, for you. Take us out, what are some of the things that we can expect from Data Robot in the next, say, six to 12 months? Any sure. sneak yeah. peeks you can give us? Uh, well, I would say, I think there's a few things I'm very excited about. One would be our AI play, or our generative AI playground, so people can have the same prompt, choose different models, evaluate their responses, and really feel comfortable this is the right one. Um, I think we're going to see a further merger of predictive and generative together. So not that I'm just giving you a prediction that Arvin is 82% likely to resubscribe uh, at USA Today, but why is that? Yeah. Why? And I can start contextualizing that. That comes to the LLM. Yeah. So it's not just the point prediction. I think we're going to see this merger of technologies ah, very soon. Cool stuff. Guys, thank you so much. It was a pleasure. For joining Justin and me Thanks on the for program. Sharing the use case you know, what you're doing to, to more than dip your toe in the Gen AI <laughs> water and what, how Data Robot and Google are facilitators. We appreciate your insights and your time. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you. much for having Our me. pleasure, guys. For our guests and Dustin Kirkland, I'm Lisa Martin. You're watching theCUBE live, day one coverage of Google Cloud Next 23, live from Moscone Center. Stick around, our next guest joins our analysts in just a minute.